Thank you very much, Casa. That was great coverage of the pediatric applications of CUS. So the presentation that I'm going to give now is focused on um, other applications for CUS in the abdomen and pelvis. And um, so all of you know, I believe that I'm a Canadian. And so the contrast agent that we've had approved since 2002 are perflutrin microspheres or Definity. And so all of the liver images that I've shown you really have been with that contrast agent. And then all of these images that I'm going to show you, they're off-label indications. And, um, and so we actually do a lot of on-label and a lot of off-label use of contrast. And as Richard nicely pointed out before, this doesn't pose any problem. It's done in all other um, kinds of contrast cross-sectional imaging. And um, so I hope that I'm just going to share with you a potpourri of other things that we've, um, that we've done. So I have considerable equipment support and research support from both Lanthius and from Samsung. So when we consider ultrasound with contrast enhancement, we know that ultrasound alone provides us with exceptionally good tissue information. And Doppler does add vascular information to that um, knowledge that we already have. However, Doppler to a large extent limits its value to large vessels with relatively rapidly moving flow. And it doesn't give us information at the tissue, perf tissue perfusion level. So contrast enhanced ultrasound is really a great advantage for us in that it allows us to see blood flow at the perfusion level. And so this is valuable whenever blood flow information is contributory to diagnosis. And so you'll see in the things that we've done, um, I really um, use it very, very extensively. And some of the areas I think that we've used it in have become much more common applications today. So in this presentation, we're going to look at problem solving in the abdomen for other organs than the liver and emphasize the benefits, of course, the no radiation, the real-time dynamic scan, the very high sensitivity that ultrasound has to its tracer, which gives us the best sensitivity for vascularity um, in the arterial phase and the overall improvement in patient care. So let's start out and look at the spleen. So for those of you who are radiologists, you know that splenic imaging on both CT and MR and on ultrasound, we see a lot of mass lesions. They're often problematic and we often don't get an answer. But I'll just show you a few that I think are quite contributory. So this really amazing patient was a 65-year-old male who I knew quite well. He had hepatitis C virus and in 2002, he had a liver transplant for cirrhosis with a hepatocellular carcinoma. So following his transplant, he actually had some recurrence of his carcinoma. All this was treated and he was under surveillance again. So because of his very strong history of so many problems and his age, his, ultra, his ultrasound was used as his major surveillance um, scan. So when he comes to see us in 2015, years after his transplant, he was there and I asked him how he was and he said he was fine. And so when we're scanning him, I see this mass in his spleen, so I ask him more questions. And only with very, very perseverant questioning would he admit that maybe he was a little more tired than normal. So we see this mass and of course on a grayscale scan, I really have no idea what this is beyond that it's a mass. So it's a focal hypoechoic mass. And of course, we're always worried about hypoechoic masses everywhere. And so we do a contrast ultrasound. And you can see really beautifully his spleen is very avid for the contrast, but the mass also is quite avid and it fills from the periphery of the mass into the center. And when I was looking at this, I thought to myself, gee, I wonder if this is a hemangioma in his spleen. But so we do those nice scans. We take those nice AP images that we get from backing up our video clip. And then, of course, we continue to watch him. And so the very next picture that we take at 56 seconds, what do we see? This is obviously a washout lesion. And it's washing out fast. And so even though there are not published validation um, information about washout, washout just always concerns me, especially when we have nice arterial phase vascularity that goes away quickly. 
And so I was concerned about that. So washout always makes me think that malignancy is possible. And so what did I recommend? That they should biopsy this. There's no other evidence of an abnormality on his abdomen. And so we must biopsy, and that's a B-cell lymphoma. So they did one other test before the biopsy, and of course that was a PET CT. And you can see that, in fact, there are no other foci of hypermetabolism in that body, but that the lesion that we saw in the spleen and predicted to be malignant and turned out to be B-cell lymphoma is, in fact, um, hypermetabolic on PET. So let's look at another patient with autoimmune hepatitis and PSC. So this is a 51-year-old female, and this is also a surveillance scan. So in this very normal-sized spleen, there's a mass that really, I'm sure you'd agree with me, it looks quite a lot like the one I just showed you, a hypochoic mass. And again, I really have no idea what this is. So we look always with color Doppler, and there's both perilesional and intralesional vascularity in this mass. And so then we come to our contrast. And I thought that this looked a little bit the same on the contrast as well. Kind of fills from the periphery into the center a little bit, but it's hyper-enhancing relative to the parenchyma, homogeneous enhancement. And when we look at these um, images, we see a very similar picture. And again, we don't know what this is yet, but we see that at one minute, this lesion, in fact, is not black. In fact, it's still enhanced more than the liver parenchyma. And by the time five minutes comes, this mass has completely dis disappeared in the liver parenchyma, and so we don't really see it at all, which suggests that it has not got washout. It has instead got the same kind of sustained enhancement that we talked about in the liver. So in this patient with a normal size spleen, we talked to the patient, we talked to the patient's doctor, and we decided that we should do increasing interval surveillance starting at three months so that in case this was a, a miss on a malignant lesion that we would catch it quickly. But we follow this lady for a long time, doubling her interval of surveillance each time it stayed the same, and this has, mass has never changed. And so I, this is benign. And what, what is it? I'm not sure what it is. Is this a hemangioma? I don't know that either. And actually doing labeled red blood cell scans of the spleen is not a highly successful endeavor because you're looking for a blood pool tumor inside a blood pool organ. So we don't know what it is, but we're not worried about it. So what can we assume from these different observations in the late phase? So washout, although popularized from liver imaging with CUS and also CTMR scan, is an important observation anywhere. And so certainly if we're seen looking at lesions and in the kidney, we're always looking for washout as a negative observation. So washout on one of the lesions and sustained enhancement on the other. So here's an 83-year-old female. We're still looking at the spleen, and she's septic, and so they're looking for a source of sepsis. So when we look at this lady, we can see that she's got a somewhat bulbous spleen, and she's got a big complex mass in her spleen. So could that be a source of sepsis? Certainly it could be. But when we look at this with our contrast examination, we can see that the mass is very well marginated. There's no enhancement within any of those solid components within that mass, and there's no evidence of hyper-enhancement of the splenic tissue around. So again, we would feel that this would probably be some kind of a complex cystic lesion and likely not of consequence and certainly not likely playing a role in her sepsis. So well-defined avascular mass suggests a complicated um, um, splenic cyst. So let's change gears now and look at a few cases of the bowel. So this is a 59-year-old male who's had crampy abdominal pain for 10 years. And this ultrasound has a requisition that says, query inflammatory bowel disease. And I will point out that this patient had had two CT scans in the prior five years. And so when we look at this patient, we can see very easily a hypochoic, very black mass 
related to the wall of this bowel. And this doesn't look anything like inflammatory bowel disease. This looks like a mass in the bowel. And so what do we do with this? Well, we do contrast enhancement, and we can see that that mass is hyper-enhancing at 14 seconds, and it's washed out by 40. So what do I think it is? Well, I think it looks like a neuroendocrine tumor, and the contrast enhancement makes me think this is malignant, and this is, in fact, a neuroendocrine tumor of the terminal ileum, or, or a classic appearance of carcinoid tumor, and this is a malignant tumor. So this patient came back about three months after this, and we didn't see anything in his bowel any longer, but he had multiple tiny hypervascular metastases in his liver. And so that kind of really beautiful depiction of tumors, we certainly don't um, search, we don't believe that this is a surveillance scan, but my, hepa uh, my um, colorectal surgeons have told me many times that we pick up many more um, small mural tumors in the bowel on ultrasound in my institution than they pick up on CT and MR scan. So that's a credit, I think, to this technique. So what about this really fabulous case? So one of my very wonderful and very astute technologists is scanning a young female, and her requisition said, query irritable bowel syndrome. So she said her bowel looks perfectly normal. She said, but her appendix looks funny. So she shows me the appendix, and the arrow's pointing to a transition point in the appendix. And you can see normal wall layers to the left of that arrow. And the tip of the appendix is quite featureless and bulbous, slightly bulbous, and it's very black without a retention of the normal wall layers. So we decided that we would do a contrast of this patient's bowel, which you can see on the bottom. So looking in axial when we inject the contrast, there is in fact a finger-like polypoid tumor growing in that appendix. And so I'll just wait till it starts again so that you can watch it. But this is really, I think, a really beautiful, beautiful scan, if it ever starts again. Um, I guess I could start it again. Yeah, so there it's starting. So there's the black appendix, and you can see when we inject the contrast that there's a finger-like polypoid mass that's hypervascular in that appendix. So we took many more pictures of this, but it was indisputable. There was a mass in there. So we reported that as a, a, a polyp in the appendix, which we thought was potentially malignant. I did not ask them to do a CT scan, but they did do a CT scan. And you can see the arrows on the axial views of the CT pointing at the appendix and on the um, um, long axis of the appendix in the sagittal view. And so the CT scan reports this as a normal appendix. They don't perceive what we see. However, my colorectal surgeons know that if we see something, it is there. So they took this appendix out, and this is a malignant polyp of her appendix. So a young girl and that small mass that we can see and pick up on grayscale and with contrast enhancement. It's really quite an exceptional case. So this is another really amazing case. This is a patient who has pancreatic pathology. So this is a 60-year-old patient, and she's currently asymptomatic. So this is a 2009 outside ultrasound scan, which was um, reported this big pancreatic duct. So you can see on her long axis and her axial view that her pancreas is really made up of this duct. But there's no comment made on this 2009 scan of all of these solitary papillary growths within this duct. And so this patient um, had an MR scan following the ultrasound, which agreed with this large, so this is a T2 image. So all of this bright, high signal intensity is fluid. So virtually her entire appendix is replaced by a massive pancreatic duct, which is interpreted to be related to a, a tumor in the pancreatic head. And so this patient had a, um, a Whipple's procedure, which was reported as showing um, an IPMN tumor, but no malignancy. So on her follow-up, you can see that they continue to use MR scan, and you can see this T1 imaging that we're looking at this same dilated duct. The pancreatic head has been removed, and so thought to have main branch IPMN. So he, she had a Whipple procedure showing no malignancy. 
So on her surveillance scan, her CT and MR scans, they don't report any pathology, although she has a rising C C199, which is a marker for cholangiocarcinoma. So although these images were reported as negative, at this point she came to us for CEUS, and you can see that within this dilated duct, now there are multiple papillary excrescences arising from the posterior wall of that duct. And when we look back at the 2009 scan, there's no question that those papillary excrescences are there, but they're much smaller. So when we do contrast-enhanced ultrasound looking at that duct, you can see that those are, in fact, hyper-enhancing nodules within the duct. And so what does this ca case support that I really believe? Whenever we're looking at any kind of tumor that's cystic and solid, Richard already alluded to this very directly before, Ultrasound has improved spatial resolution for showing these papillary excrescences, and contrast-enhanced ultrasound has superior sensitivity to its tracer in the arterial phase. So what is this? This is a malignant papillary tumor um, of her pancreas, which was surgically confirmed. So a malignant IPMN, really beautifully shown on ultrasound, and we hadn't done any surveillance until we did this scan. So another case of the pancreas is a patient who has von Hippel-Lindau disease, and he has multiple prior MR scans, and they've interpreted a cystic pancreatic mass. So here's the MR scan, again, T2 imaging, which shows this very bright mass marked by the arrows. So that very bright mass suggests a cystic or fluid content in that pancreatic mass. And post-gadolinium, there's not convincing enhancement. However, when the patient comes for ultrasound, first of all, we're told that we're looking for a cystic mass, but we don't see a cystic mass. Instead, on the long axis and on the axial view, we see an echogenic and obviously solid-looking mass in the pancreas. And when we do the contrast injection, you can see very easily that this mass is a hyper-enhancing mass um, in the pancreas. So not only is the mass not cystic, um, the mass is not avascular either. So this is a hyper-enhancing solid mass lesion. And this, again, is a classic neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas. And I personally feel that ultrasound with CUS does an exceptional job of the pancreas, but this is a hard battle to fight. So this is a case that shows the similar value of ultrasound. So this is a 72-year-old woman who comes with jaundice. And so she has dilated biliary ducts on her CT scan. So we can see easily these very dilated biliary ducts, but we don't see the explanation for the bile duct dilatation. So this patient goes on to have MR scan, which also shows T2 um, high signal intensity corresponding with all of these dilated biliary ducts, but with no obvious explanation. So then she comes finally for an ultrasound, and we confirm easily and readily that she's got dilated biliary ducts. You all will recognize that double duct sign. But when we look further, we can also see that within her main biliary duct, there's a papillary growth, which we can see in long axis and in axillary plane. So this is solid tissue, which is in the duct. So of course, this could be some kind of sludge ball or concretion, but well, how do we resolve this? Well, we do contrast enhancement, and we can see easily that these papillary growths are in fact hyper-enhancing nodules. And so this is a patient who we think has got papillary growth. So this is malignant papillary intraductal cholangiocarcinoma. And I think that these scans both really demonstrate how much more sensitive ultrasound is to pick up these papillary growths in the duct. So this was, as my surgeon who looked after this, he said, well, that's a home run for CEUS if I've ever seen one. So what can we conclude by the cases that I've shown you? So these show the extreme sensitivity of CEUS to arterial phase vascularity, and we see this regardless of its time or duration. And it shows also the superior resolution of ultrasound for the internal contents of any cystic mass.
So let me show you now a few cases of patients that have renal failure. And so as has been pointed out by all of the previous speakers, these patients with renal failure are just a real, real strength for contrast-enhanced ultrasound. And so when physicians learn that they can do CEUS with impunity, you don't have to worry about how often you do a scan and how much it can show you as compared to um, unenhanced CT or unenhanced MR scan. CT and MR are absolutely reliant on contrast presence to make the diagnoses that they root. Um, we'll, we'll resume where we left off. Sorry about that interference. But um, so what we're looking at here are patients who have got renal failure. And so this is a 35-year-old girl who had a renal transplant. And you can see her transplant kidney um, in her left lower quadrant. And she's got a little bit of hydro of the renal pelvis. And so shortly after her, her surgery, she complained of increasing abdominal girth. And so we can see on this unenhanced CT scan, this large um, um, low signal um, mass lesion. And it was thought to be a probable um, urinoma or, or seroma. And so she was followed really for many months with this increasing abdominal girth in her postoperative period. Um, hey, Richard, do you want to turn the lights down a little? And so when we scanned her, we, this is the mass that we saw in her pelvis. And so for those of you who do a lot of gyne scanning, you can see immediately that this does not have the appearance of a seroma for certain. So this looks like a tumor, and this looks like it's a mucin-containing tumor. That low level echoes with all those septations. So we are thinking that this is a neoplastic lesion, and so mucin for sure. When we do contrast-enhanced ultrasound, we get enhancement of all of those septae and the big thick wall of this cyst. So we call this an ovarian neoplasm. And so this is a proven mucinous cyst adenoma of the ovary. So now I'm gonna show you two similar cases. These are really fascinating cases. And so the first is a 42 year old male who was six weeks post radical nephrectomy for renal cell carcinoma. So he had an aggressive renal cell carcinoma necessitating removal of his entire kidney with radical procedure. And so he was presented to the emergency with acute right flank pain and elevated creatinine. And so he also had an unenhanced CT scan. So when we look at this unenhanced CT, you can see that his left kidney is present. So his right kidney is the one that's removed. And you can see this very large fluid collection, which is really filling his entire right flank. And within this fluid collection, which is low signal um, density, you can see that there's some high density material and also an appearance that suggests a hematocrit with a fluid debris level. And so this was interpreted as a probable spontaneous retroperitoneal hematoma. And so he was admitted to the hospital for pain control. And he came for an ultrasound a few days later for follow-up of his hematoma. So one of my girls took this nice picture and she showed it to me and I said, what is that? And she said, it's a hematoma. And I said, who said it's a hematoma? And she said, the CT scan. And I said, well, gee, it doesn't look much like a hematoma. What do we want to do? We'll do a contrast ultrasound. So not so suggestive of hematoma. So you can see when we inject the contrast that we can see beautiful homogeneous enhancement of the liver. But then we can see below the liver that the entire mass lesion interpreted as the hematoma is enhancing. And so this, of course, is not retroperitoneal hematoma, which would have no blood flow at all. So this is infiltrative carcinoma of massive proportion through the retroperitoneum. And so you can see all of that enhancement. So any kind of tumor that we see, we can really show the degree of vascularization very well. Now, let's look at another kind of similar case. So this is a 79-year-old male, and he had a history of transitional cell carcinoma in the left kidney, which was surgically removed. So he presents with right flank pain. And so here's his unenhanced CT, and you can see that there's a mass here as well. So he's got a mass that's deep to the kidney, and so we can't tell is this for sure related to the kidney or outside. 
And is it complex cystic or is it a solid mass? So again, when we come to doing um, further ultrasound, we can see the kidney very nicely here, and we can see that the mass is in fact lying posterior to the kidney. So the kidney seems quite intact, and there's the mass posterior, and it's kind of a low-level gray mass, and it's hard to tell its nature, but it's extra renal. And so when we do our contrast-enhanced ultrasound, we can see the kidney enhance avidly, and we show that this mass is in fact virtually completely avascular. And so this, of course, is a very favorable appearance. So in this patient, we would interpret this as a probable spontaneous retroperitoneal hematoma, which would be managed conservatively. So quite different result. Um, so avascular benign lesion hematoma. So when we compare these two patients, both of them present with a... Um, a, a, a retroperitoneal mass, and you can see the very big difference. So patient A has got hyper-enhancing nodules all through that mass with infiltrative carcinoma in the peritoneum, and the avascular mass representing a hematoma is shown in, in patient B. Now, so as contrast-enhanced ultrasound in those with renal failure is far superior to unenhanced CT scan. So CT relies on its improved ability to show solid organ pathology on the basis of intravenous contrast injection. And so ultrasound is superior to the baseline CT scan, and CUS is far superior to any CT for demonstration and characterization of all solid organ pathology. And so this was a publication that my student, Summit Sauni, prepared with me, and we published an ultrasound quarterly in 2017, and it really shows quite astonishing results looking at 200 consecutive patients with an unenhanced CT on whom we did CUS. Now, um, so, so the kidney, so I know that Richard's already spoken about the kidney, but after the liver, the kidney is the most established for CUS characterization of renal masses. And so two pathologies, which Richard did emphasize, demonstrate the superior sensitivity of CUS to its tracer. And these are cystic renal cell carcinoma and papillary carcinoma. So let me show you, first of all, a 58-year-old male with Crohn's disease, and he had a bowel resection, and he developed, um, um, oh, I apologize. I'm going to something else. I didn't show you the kidney cases because I obviously took them out in deference to Richard. So now we'll go on to looking at fistula imaging with contrast ultrasound. So this is a 58-year-old male who has Crohn's disease and had bowel resection in 2017 and developed a midline cutaneous fistula post-resection. And so although he had um, multiple attempts to characterize what was going on, they were somewhat unsuccessful. So on grayscale, we're looking in the pelvis, so his bladder's on the right side of the image, and then the mass that I've labeled, P, is kind of like a phlegmonous mass, a hypoechoic mass, interdigitating with the fat, and a failed contrast um, fistulogram had been performed. So when the patient comes to see us, we're doing a contrast fistulogram. So we use a very soft, very small um, um, catheter. And when we um, were talking about dose of contrast, so in these patients, we take about a 25 mil syringe of saline and we squirt it into um, a sterile tub. And then we take the um, syringe filled with contrast agent and we only put in not mils or even 0.1 or 0.2 mils, we just put in drops of contrast, like so maybe two drops of contrast, maybe three drops of contrast. We're not so precise. But when we inject the contrast for the fistulogram, it's quite astonishing. So first we did a general intravenous injection, and it shows that we're not looking at any abscesses and that everything in this region is enhancing. But then when it comes to the fistula, here we've put the catheter into the orifice of the fistula up on the skin here, and you can see that we can trace this fistula all the way down deep into the peritoneum, and then at this point we're coming into the bladder and the, and the contrast is entering into the bladder. So we know that there's an, ent an enterovesical fistula, and then 
when we go further, so there's our fistula that you can see how beautifully we can trace this fistula. And as I've said, these fistulas can be quite difficult to trace when you use um, a, a bigger catheter and radiologic um, contrast agent. And then here we can see the bladder that's got microbubbles within it as soon as we start to inject the, fi the fistula in the skin. And then as we go um, here, yeah, it's coming to the bladder. Yeah, so that is showing the edge of the fistula. And you can see the bubbles of contrast as they come into the bladder. And then you can see when we look over where the bowel is, that similarly we can see that the bowel lumen is also filled with the contrast agent that we're injecting through a tiny catheter in this patient's skin. So um, this is quite helpful to them in that they're aware that there's obviously fistulization to both the bladder and to the bowel from that open skin um, um, area. So let's look now at the female pelvis. So this is a 40-year-old female who has a transvaginal rectal pelvic ultrasound to rule out rectovaginal endometriosis. So she's got vaginal and rectal pain. And so let's see what we see when we do this. So this is an endovaginal scan, and we're looking at her sigmoid colon. And we can see the very, very typical appearance of the on-plaque very hypoechoic mass lesion that's related to the bowel wall. And so when we do contrast enhancement of this mass, you can see on the grayscale side the position of the, of the um, suspect endometrioma. And so the bowel is enhancing, and the mass lesion is not avidly enhancing as a carcinoma would be expected to do, and instead is relatively hypovascular throughout the arterial phase. Um, so another, this is the same patient where we're looking at her left ovary. So when we look at the left ovary, we can see that this part is cystic and there's a solid component here. And so when we inject the contrast, we wouldn't have done this. This is a very benign looking grayscale picture, but we were already injecting her bowel plaque. And so we can see that in fact, there's very little of suspicion in here, just cystic areas in that ovary with one large um, um, fluid component. Now, this is another patient who also has an ovarian mass found incidentally on ultrasound scan. And so when we look at this patient, we can see that we're looking at the ovary ovarian cyst and inside what looks on grayscale like a retractile clot. And so if we are going to do a contrast ultrasound on this, which we probably would not usually do, you can see that we can confirm easily that that large mass lesion within the ovary is completely avascular. And this would be treated expectantly as a resolving hematoma within the ovary. So contrast that with another patient who has pelvic pain and a right ovarian mass. So when we look at this patient, we can see the ovary, and inside we can see that there's this focal mass lesion within a bulky ovary. When we do contrast-enhanced injection of this mass, we can see easily that this is a hyper-enhancing nodule. And so this would be an, um, a nodule that would be um, um, subject to biopsy, and this is a granulosa cell tumor in the ovary. And so if you consider what we're doing with MR and CT when we're looking at ovarian masses, that's what we're trying to show is if there's hypervascular foci within these um, ovarian masses. And again, here's washout of this mass at one minute with even more washout at two minutes. Now, um, Andre's going to speak about this, so I'm only going to show one case, I believe. But when we consider contrast-enhanced ultrasound in ablative therapy, it's really, really a very, very valuable technique. And so here we can see on the left side, we're looking at a grayscale and a CUS image of a liver tumor, and it's hyper-enhancing. And then the ablation is performed in this middle panel, and then when we do an immediate post-procedural um, follow-up scan, we can see that our nodule is now completely avascular, suggesting a successful treatment. And so this is really um, very, very commonly done in my own department, and I think in Andre's as well. But in many places in the United States, these procedures are not done with ultrasound guidance and not done with CUS.
And so I'll just show you one other case. This is a patient who's got a hypervascular tumor um, on the pre-ablation scan. And then on the immediate post-ablation scan, you can see that the ablation site is more superficial than the tumor, and that the tumor and its hyperenhancement persists. So what does this suggest? This was a microwave procedure, and the microwave device does not have the same kind of anchoring as radiofrequency ablation. So this is undoubtedly the microwave probe has slipped back a bit, and it's not in the tumor. So you can see that they repeat the ablation here, and when they come back, there's the original ablation site, and then there's the completely and successfully ablated tumor. And so this is a very valuable technique, which decreases the requirement for repeats procedures later. And if we look at another really valuable case, this is a patient who's had several procedures for HCC in the past. And when we look at grayscale, you can see we see not one, not two, but three echogenic nodules in this liver. So it's very hard for us to tell on the grayscale what's abnormal and what should be done. But when we do CEUS, you can see very easily that the nodule, the least suspicious of the nodules, is hyperenhancing. And then when we move over here, the hyperenhancing nodule here shows washout. And so, of course, what do we know? We know that that's HCC, and that specific nodule can be targeted for reablation. Now, I'll end with talking about contrast-enhanced ultrasound of the bowel. That's an O instead of a P. So does, um, this describes a really novel technique that I think really makes excellent contribution to looking um, at the bowel. So when we look at the bowel with grayscale, we have a chart that we use that we um, me predict the activity of bowel that's abnormal in inflammatory bowel disease. So we look at wall thickness, inflammatory fat, we look at color Doppler signal, mural blood flow, and then we make a grade of whether the patient has mild, moderate, or severe disease. And so just looking at the grayscale pictures, you can see quite easily and quickly. So the normals in the upper left corner and the bad actively inflamed bowel is at the bottom, and wall thickness is most sensitive for determining activity. And then inflammatory fat, the upper left picture again, really not showing inflammatory fat, whereas the bottom picture shows this big mass of echogenic fat, so again, severe, more severe disease. And color Doppler goes from no color to virtually transmural blood flow, even on color Doppler. And then other features, speculation of the bowel wall and fixation. Now, the most important thing, though, of course, is blood flow. So if we look at this nice patient who's got thick bowel on ultrasound, we know that active inflammation is accompanied by increased splanchnic blood flow, mesenteric vascularization, and neoangiogenesis of the intestinal wall. And we interpret blood flow as reflective of inflammatory activity. So if we put color Doppler on this picture, we can see beautifully that there's vascularization of the wall of the bowel. So what's wrong with just using Doppler? Well, the problem is that if patients are very large or the bowel is very deep, um, we can't see the blood flow very well. And most important, of course, is that we cannot ever see blood flow at the perfusion level. So CEUS allows us to do subjective and objective evaluation of the blood flow in the bowel wall. So the subjective evaluation gives us a qualitative assessment showing us transmural enhancement or a comb sign in the mesentery and the vessels. But the objective information is most important, giving us quantitative assessment measurement of parameters. So if we look for the subjective first, we can see from our, our image there that we're looking at transmural enhancement of a lupa bowel shown in cross-section. And you can see the supporting vascularization of the mesentery. So that would suggest that that would be active bowel. Just another beautiful example transmural enhancement with the comb sign reflecting the vascularization of the vessels in the mesentery. Now, when I show you a little schematic here, so here we're looking at a loop of bowel in cross-section, and you can see that there's two regions of interest that are placed within the bowel wall. And there are 
intended to encompass only the bowel wall. And so then when we inject the contrast, we can see on the upper panels that the bowel enhances quite avidly. And on the bottom panel, we can see the time intensity curve that's generated when we inject that contrast. So this is a two minute clip that I've slowed down to about 20 seconds. And we can see that after an enhancement, then we have a slow progressive decline of the enhancement down towards the baseline. And so it's this quantitative assessment where we can look at the peak enhancement and the area under the time intensity curve to get our values. And so when we're looking at our, our data, we're looking at, at linear data, always raw linear data, but we can show it in log or linear display, and then we can have fitted curves for the linear data. And what we're measuring is the fractional blood volume, the blood flow, and the transit time. And so we get these kinds of time intensity curves. And so this is just a real patient where we're looking at the bowel in long axis. You can see we put four regions of interest just for quality control. And then you can see um, beneath this that this is our linear evaluation um, of, the, of the data. And here is the log curve. And so um, although we use this, a curve fitted, this has got a curve fitting on it. Um, for the area under the curve, we always prefer to look at the peak enhancement um, in um, the, the log value. And then this is a patient who has very severe disease where we can see the transmural enhancement and our, our linear and our logarithmic data. And this is very reproducible and extremely valuable to us for assessing activity um, in these uh, patients. And I'll end just by talking about this. The most biggest contribution that ultrasound makes, I think, is an assessment of strictures in patients with IBD. And so we ask ourselves the question, is the stricture inflammatory? In which case the patient would likely have medical therapy or escalated medical therapy. Or is the stricture chronic? In which case um, the patient would go for surgical treatment. And so we believe that low shear wave elastography and high CUS associates with an inflammatory stricture, whereas we think that high shear wave elastography, in other words, very stiff bowel and low vascularity, will predict bowel that won't respond to medical therapy and should be surgically removed. So I'll just show you one case. This is a 49-year-old male, and he's had Crohn's disease since 1982. Is it any wonder he's got chronic disease in his bowel? So he presents with obstructive symptoms, and he's been on no medication for many years, and he had one prior surgery, a right hemicolectomy. So here we're looking at his neoterminal ileum. So first of all, his bowel has no bowel wall layers. It's grossly thickened to 1.2 centimeters. And so certainly the doctrine that wall thickness is associated with activity is true, but it's not always true, and this is an exception. So this very, very, very thick bowel with no wall layers is what we see when we look at his bowel. Fixed luminal apposition, we're looking at about a 12 to 15 centimeter length, which looks like a big stricture. When we look at the bowel proximal to that thick segment, we see evidence of incomplete bowel obstruction. And ultrasound has a great advantage in that here, we can tell this bowel is obstructed because it has anti-grade and retrograde peristalsis in the same loop. So those are never normal observations, and that's an obstructed bowel. So when we do color Doppler interrogation of this bowel, we really can't get any blood flow at all. It's very low. And when we do contrast-enhanced ultrasound, I know that you're not familiar with these values, but this is very low. It suggests virtually no activity. However, when we do the elastography, we can see that the, the hardness is very, very much increased. So these values, 3.5 to 4.6 meters per second, that bowel would be like a pipe. So we suggest that this is a chronic disease and that this is a surgical candidate. And this patient's bowel is removed, confirming um, absolutely chronic thickened bowel related not so much to fibrotic change but to muscular hypertrophy. So what have we looked at in this potpourri we looked at multiple different organs with different problems. 
And so CUS may provide benefit in any situation where blood flow information may be contributory. And so certainly we do contrast of many different organs, many, much of it on request and as elective procedures. And um, our, our perspective on where we're going is only to broader horizons. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah. 